So we have the recording in progress now. Uh, Mr. Vasudeva, former PCCF, Suti Chakkar, former Secretary Government of India, as Justice K.J. Balakrishnan, Honorable Chief Justice of India, uh, the chief guest for the show as well. General V.K. Singh shall be joining around 3.30, uh, current Minister of State, Road Transport and Highways, Government of India and Civil Aviation as well, additional charge. Then we have Mr. S. Kumar, former CMD, NSIC, MD and CEO, South Indian Bank, Mr. Mulli Ramakrishnan, one of my dear friends. South Indian Bank must be credited with having done a huge amount of work in the last two years for the MSME sector. Thereby, the relevance of Mr. S. V. Kumar, Mr. Mulli Ramakrishnan being on board together uh, assumes relevant significance today. Now, let me start the show with uh, the uh, you know opening remarks from Mr. H.P. Kumar, former Professor H.P. Kumar, who was the former chairman of the NSIC. Uh, what does the banking and NBFCs uh, you know, stand today, uh, hold relevance as part of the India growth story in the 75th, 75th year of Indian independence? And what are the learnings of the last two years? What are the areas that we need to focus upon, Mr. Kumar? Probably we can start with the opening notes and then we'll have Justice Reji Balakrishnan. His flight is about to start at four o'clock, so we'll have to bring him on board immediately after Mr. Kumar's opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Amit Ji. My greetings to all the distinguished personalities who are available here. Uh, Honorable Justice Balakrishnan Saab, everybody knows him very well. In fact, the whole country knows him. There is no need to introduce him. We have, uh, fortunately, after a long, long time, I am able to meet Kakkarji, who was with working with us. In fact, we were working together. And uh, I think Dr. D.K. Agarwal has also joined uh, just now. So, Agarwal sir, good afternoon. Very good nice afternoon. to meet you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine. Perfectly good okay. Thank you. Okay. All colleagues of the chamber, D.K. Agarwal, former president of the PhD Chamber of Commerce and Industry and also the capital markets, is also on board. Agarwal sir, we have a distinguished gathering today for the banking summit. And the, uh, you know, Mr. Mulli Ramakrishnan is also now live. And Justice Balakrishnan Sahab, uh, you know, the great former Chief Justice of India is on board. Kumar Sahab, sorry to have interrupted you. Please carry on, sir. Oh, no, it's okay. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Mulli Ramakrishnan, the MD and CEO of uh, South Indian Bank. And we have other friends also. Uh, I think a lot of distinguished persons uh, who are addressing this very important conference. Well, I would say that uh, I will be speaking on the ecosystem available for MSME sector in the country. We all know that uh, uh, MSMEs in the country comprise of 99% of the enterprises. It's only 1% which are the big corporates. And the contribution of MSMEs is well known in the country's economy, whether in terms of manufacturing or uh, employment creation or regional economic dispersal in the country. Uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, it's 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 a good fortune for me to meet Mrs. Kakkar also today. In fact, after a long time, uh, good afternoon, uh, madam. In fact, uh, it's indeed a pleasure seeing you after quite some time. We have been working together in the ministry when I was the chairman. So, um, having said that, in fact, the MSME sector has tremendous role to play in the country's economy. If we are if we are thinking of you know, 5 trillion economy by the year 2025, because majority of the economic activity and the employment comes from the MSME sector. So um, while MSME sector's importance is well known and the government has taken various initiatives, in fact, a lot of policy measures which are pro MSMEs, and that is the probably reason that Indian MSME sector has become virtually a role model for the rest of the world, particularly the developing countries. And um, we, in fact, keep sharing our best practices with a lot of countries uh, in the world. In fact, uh, as an SIC chairman, I have been working with the 30, 35 countries uh, to provide them, in fact, the um, models that we have implemented in India, which has created so much of, you know, robust uh, sector and create, given a lot of employment in the country. So while we know the importance of MSME sectors uh, in the country and uh, the need to, in fact, propel further the growth prospects of this sector. There are certain constraints and, <clears throat> you know, challenges which MSME sector is still facing. And we have been harping upon the government, in fact, to deal with those challenges. Uh, the government is quite receptive. It is not that the government is not uh, taking care of them, but there are st still some issues which need to be addressed. And I, I will just briefly mention before I, you know, close my initial remarks, because I think Justice Honorable Balakrishnan uh, ji has to probably uh, uh, 
give his opening address as he is probably his flight is scheduled to start so the issues of credit timely availability of credit cost effective availability of credit and the speed at which this credit should be available as of now as per world bank study there is still a gap of about 400 billion dollars worth of availability of credit for the msme sector almost 25 lakh to 30 lakh crore uh, shortage <clears throat> we know that msme sector can really grow at a very very fast pace it has been growing in any case it has been growing faster than the larger collective credit is made available the government had started in fact giving some kind of financial incentive at 2% interest subvention and then export credit um, in benefit also those things need to continue during covid 19 time we saw that <clears throat> i think who better than dr dk agrawal knows who has been dealing with from the chamber in fact during the hard times of covid that how much persuasion we did with the government to in fact provide those additional funding lines emergency credit line guarantee scheme and you know stressed asset fund and fund of funds all these things in fact um, we have been working together with the government and government has listened to in fact these demands from the industry and given some uh, you know benefits but then over a period of long term what we need is a, a kind of a liberal policy which can really facilitate larger flow of credit and particularly in terms of the cost of credit i think we have um, the md and ceo of south indian bank he will be the best person in fact to give further uh, you know uh, further uh, clarity on this issue as to what is uh, what is the government approach on this and how banks are dealing with this shortage the other two issues which i would like to highlight briefly in fact is the taxation problems and the gst particularly because gst implementation while it has been all with good intention but gst has created a lot of you know compliance burden and also a fear psychosis in the minds of the msmes who are not able to basically deal with the you know the different requirements but the, the requirements have been changing day and day day and day, day out so that issue is needs to be addressed particularly with regard to compliances uh, i am not talking of the tax rates uh, on gst because that is uh, that will be another and that's a you know, continuous uh, you know demand from the industry that you keep rationalizing the tax rates Uh, another issue which i would like to mention is the you know um, startup ecosystem which has been created by the government of india under the startup india program and um, that has given benefit to a very large, small number of units only 70 75000 startups have been registered but then looking at our country's need for employment creation i think we need to develop a system uh, to recognize the startups and give them incentives so that all the business enterprises new business enterprises which are starting in the country and i am sure that millions and millions of new business enterprises need to start to provide these self employment opportunities and we have requested the government that this startup ecosystem should be widened to in fact recognize each and every startup whether it's a formal startup or an informal startup registered under this if you give some incentive some recognition tax rebates tax rebates particularly with regard to the taxes to you know concessions to proprietorship and partnership concerns also like you know the government has given this concession corporate tax concession to companies uh, agarwal sir probably would share that concern because we have been writing to the government on this that you have given to the companies tax concession of 25% but not to corporate not to private proprietorship concerns and partnership concerns and not even to llps whereas majority of the msmes belong to this sector proprietorship partnerships and llps so these kind of uh, you know disparities are you know being seen as a some kind of a challenge for the msme sector i have many other issues we'll keep discussing on those issues i will not take much time these are some of the important issues which i thought let me highlight so with that i thank uh, vision india forum in fact and particularly mr amit goenka i'll be available for any further discussion so over to you amit ji for taking thank it you, forward thank, thank you thank you kumar sir thank you kumar sir what a wonderful way to set the tone for this wonderful uh, evening today with all the distinguished luminaries that are on board already justice kg balakrishnan former chief justice of india uncle balakrishnan namaskar welcome to the show and uh, 
you know, uh, I know you told me, Amit, why are you calling me for law and order issues? That's fine. But then why are you calling me for MSME banking and all those things? I'm not an expert on that. But I said, if you are not an expert on that, none of us know anything about it. <laughs> so basically any topic under the sun, Justice K. Jibala Krishnan is the man to go to. Sir, your second views before you have to go and run for the flight. Uh, what are the views on or suggestions or guidance or your... Uh, you know, uh, uh, wonderful, uh, you know, suggestions to the banking and the NBFC sector. Okay. Because that's a sector that has been plaguing the country over the last two years because of so many uh, unfortunate, uh, you know, issues coming to the forefront limelight. Though that is the case of probably, you know, coming to the forefront a bit too late. But then in the going going forward in the future, what would you have to suggest to the banking and the NBFC, NBFC fraternity, which are one of the financial uh, pillars of the India's uh, entire growth story. Over to you, Justice Saab, KG Balakrishnan, former Chief Justice of India. Ms. Ramit Koyanka and very, very distinguished uh, people who participate in this discussion. I told Amit that I am an utter stranger to this subject <laughs> because uh, apart from the law or any other subject, uh, banking, uh, as just as ordinary citizen, I know only about the banking system. But we, the common citizen, know the banking sector plays a very, very vital role in the development of this country, the commercial activities of this country, the employment opportunities on this country, to eradicate poverty from this uh, country. The banking sector is, if it is vital and it plays a role, great role, in making the country move forward. That is important. And uh, we have got a fairly good system of banking. We have got very, very eminent uh, uh, banks in this country. They are all fairly doing, except uh, the, since some of the banks have got uh, this NPA, non-performing assets uh, are in large uh, quantity in some of the banks. That, uh, but it is, uh, they are giving loans. Uh, what could be done? Uh, if they uh, misuse the power, misuse their opportunity and uh, make take the loan and uh, they use it for some other purpose, not for the development of the country. It is a sad spectacle. That is one thing which uh, no banking uh, authorities can prevent it. Um, they have to lend money. They have to improve the conditions of the industry. But uh, sometimes the industries are not making use of that. Uh, some of the uh, short-sighted or uh, crooked uh, personalities are not doing it today. So in, uh, there was, uh, mm -hmm. when, uh, when I was in the Supreme Court, large uh, number of uh, the NPA, non-performing assets, uh, the case was pending. Still, it may be pen pending in the Supreme Court, I hope. What could be done? Um, the court cannot give any directions uh, appropriate, but uh, <clears throat> we have to, if we make the rigorous conditions, uh, the system itself uh, will not work properly. Uh, I, I I cannot give any uh, competent advice or the, the, about the awards and the, but uh, uh, by and large, the Indian banking system and all the, uh, in all other countries uh, facing so many other problems. Uh, India, Indian banking system still survived. That is a good, good thing. And we have no recession, no problem. So far, they suffered. So I, with this words, I uh, conclude. And thank you for uh, making a party to this proceeding. Thank you. Thank you very much. Justice, sir, Justice Balakrishnan, sir. Uh, you know, just one small thing. You know, the huge amount of uh, financial irregularities uh, which ensue with these NPAs and which, which are basically malafide and not part of the uh, system uh, pushing them to become NPAs because of business issues or because of, you know, ecosystem uh, issues from the so economic perspective or the global economic perspective, issues which are malafide in nature, which are, you know, voluntary in nature. Do you think that they should be brought very, very strongly under the criminal uh, procedures. But it is, uh, it is not possible to take strong steps uh, because the money has been siphoned off to, uh, through other means. Uh, and they, they pretend to be penniless uh, 
so what could be done uh, it is a uh, unfortunate situation but the uh, only thing that there could be some drastic uh, uh, steps should be taken against them i don't think that the money itself could be recovered by that is that should be very sad situation but in all other countries it is there these sort of things happen in all over the world that is but in india i don't know the extent to which india is exposed to this sort of problem is i do not know but uh, we should uh, always take a check on this thank you thank you very much thank you justice sahab uh, thank you so much for your valuable time uh, and uh, i'm sure you will have a safe and you know wonderful journey and you will be meeting mr muli ramakrishnan there in cochin because he is okay. also based out of kerala <laughs> kerala okay, okay. so thank you. so, thank so you. wonderful thank opportunity you. sir now narendra ji narendra ji former cmd indian overseas bank one of the experts of the banking industry has also joined us narendra ji your views uh, on the uh, issues of the banking industry currently contemporarily and what the honorable former chief justice was suggesting uh, what are the you know resorts what are the mechanisms that can be resorted to from a legal perspective also or what is being done by the government to recover these npas and how can the banking and the nbfc sector really outshine uh, the other sectors in terms of performance because the government is putting a lot of philip towards it what should the sector or the sectoral uh, what do you call uh, the people who are the stakeholders of the sector take care of so that in the future we don't face such situations so thank you amit ji that uh, and we are uh, honorable uh, uh, justice uh, uh, balakrishna saab and uh, all the other uh, participants and it's a great uh, uh, happiness for us that uh, amit has been vision india is doing quite a lot of webinars throughout in the this amrita mahotsav and with the participation of eminent speakers and i think today the uh, whatever uh, banking awards for the outstanding performance so i congratulate all the award winners as well as amit ji for this uh, program and uh, we are normally you know when we the uh, banks uh, in india or overall banking system we normally suddenly now talk more on npa but uh, that is uh, being there that uh, we can uh, definitely talk on that which i will come back but the other side the banks in india have done uh, considerably lot of work in terms of uh, financial inclusion in terms of reaching into the priority sectors of the uh, uh, in, uh, population in terms of, of agriculture credit micro and small industries credit in the retail credit or in in uh, today uh, the credit to the uh, what do you call individual housing and, uh, other than that vehicle uh, uh, again against the loan vehicles or even in a common during the covid when the people were needed a lot of liquidity the banks extended loan against uh, jewelry and uh, in most of the place when they had a not a much income suddenly they have to meet the medical expenses or uh, all that the bank gave a liquidity against that similarly now even businessman also uh, under the emergency credit scheme banks extended uh, immediately 10% of their limits uh, to ex across the sectors of the customers and that gave a handy for even particularly micro and small industry to see that they don't get uh, any closed and they can uh, immediately pick up raw material and start the production after the first wave is over so that has helped over and above that uh, government of india came with the emergency credit guarantee scheme wherein uh, up to 3 crore uh, 3 lakh crores of uh, credit in the beginning later it has been extended to 1.5 uh, lakh crores again so around 4.5 lakh crores and all the vulnerable sections of the what you call industry particularly tourism hospitality medical and uh, where or even uh, in terms of the transport supply chain management and uh, there were around 26 sectors which are identified by the kamath committee again that the reserve bank also came with this uh, what you call restructuring of this credit uh, uh, there also they had a large credit separate a micro and small industry separate and uh, individual loans separate that was the first restructure which was again followed by the second restructure in the 2021 and there were immediately up to august two times a moratorium were given and which again came handy and under the atmanirbhar bharat of our prime minister and finance minister 
they brought lot of uh, uh, reforms including in the public sector or in this the, the banks and uh, that you know, so many sectors were opened up and so many things were uh, given for commercial or the private sector participation and that has also helped so the bank per se under the financial inclusion when our prime minister gave a call of jandhan account uh, the banks opened uh, within hardly a, maybe a three months around 40 crores of account and today it is more than 42 crores of jandhan account that is covered by aadhar and mobile and there the balance is 1.6 lakh uh, crores of uh, balance and all the government schemes and all their subsidies, all their uh, whatever assistance were all sent through the direct benefit transfer, including the migrant laborers, including the farmer subsidy that every year uh, 6,000 rupees per quarter, 2,000, all were by click of the button. So in terms of the financial inclusion, in terms of bringing the either to unserved sectors to the banking fold and of course today it's not only public sector bank lot of uh, what you call uh, private sector bank new generation bank micro finance institution nbfc and also some of the what you call fintechs who are providing digital uh, reach and with the simple method of uh, kyc they are able to make uh, reach out to the these such of the sector and uh, in the particularly they were uh, the banks also you know during the covid could not uh, reach out to these customers so everything has been now made digital similarly under the government they have a hardly 59 minutes you could give in principle sanction for sme so that is also catching up and uh, with the such uh, technology today including documentation is done through the technology and during that that emergency credit the bank sent a letters to the eligible borrowers that you are eligible for this you have to opt for that so in the you of that and similarly the opening of branches in all the rural and unbanked areas out of six lakh villages as per the reserve bank report almost uh, five lakh uh, fifty thousand villages have been already covered by physical branches. Now, in the current year, actually, uh, the new generation banks are also now expanding branches. Of course, the public sector bank in the last two years slightly lowered the opening of the branch, but if you are opening, other than uh, there is an ATM or any point of sale or micro ATM, so with the various other types of uh, gadgets, including using the customer service center established by the uh, government of India, the banking service is made available to everybody. Today, during the COVID, 90% of the population use the banking through uh, mobile banking or internet banking or uh, digital mode banking or through the what you call credit card, debit card or uh, point of sale terminal everywhere. So the, these number also become active as the unit of extending service. Of course, now I will come to the point of uh, NPA. Okay, during the Narendraji, Narendra ji, yeah. let, me, let me interrupt you. Uh, just you know, we'll have to yeah. mix this show up because otherwise it's going to be a 10-15 minutes monologue from each, each each of them. Yeah. You 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 spoken, so probably we'll bring you back again after five, seven, ten minutes. Okay, okay, okay. I'll no, request, you are NPA, I, I, NPA I, I, thing. I will collect later. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll let me bring in Mr. Vasudeva. Mr. Vasudeva is the former additional secretary government of India. He's handled the environment ministry. He's handled the home ministry as well. Vasudeva ji. Uh, you know, you wanted a huge amount of support from a sustainability perspective for, from the banking sector. Just probably two to three minutes time, you could just fill it out before I bring in uh, Madam Kakkar Agarwalji and the keynote speaker, Mr. Uh, Muli Ramakrishnan. Vasudeva ji. <coughs> no, Amaji, see, I, I want to see, I have not worked directly into the sector, but two, three issues I can raise. See, government as well as banks, have given a lot of flip to the uh, MSC, MSC, MSC sector. But what is happening is after getting benefits, NPA is a separate thing, after getting benefits, about 25 to 40% of these industries, they're closing. They close and go off. That impacts the growth and development of the country. Secondly, there is hindrance. A lot of time is taken in giving approvals for to startups and to other industries in setting up industries. Although single window in all these states, there are single window mechanism wherein headed by CMs of each and every state, the single window clearance is given, but they have to then go back to each and every department about 
25 to 30 departments to get approvals to start the industries. Although online system has been developed, but we need to have at the state industries department level, a single window system, online single window system, time bound online window system so that this sector gets flip. It has got a lot of potential in India so that it get flip uh, uh, for further growth and development of the country. Wonderful point. I mean, this is a point which I hardly, I personally am not a banker, but I, this is a wonderful point. After getting the facilities, they're closing down. Uh, I'll, I'll be talking to Mr. Muli Ramakrishnan because he's handled a lot of MSMEs under his leadership. And today we are proud to also announce that he will be uh, awarded, he's being awarded as the uh, Mr. Muli Ramakrishnan. Uh, uh, he is going to be awarded with the, you know, top leadership award for banking excellence as a young leader, along with a few other bankers like Mr. Uh, we have the, you know, from the ICICI Bank, Mr. Bakshi, then we have Mr. R. Sitaraman, the, the CEO of the Doha Bank, because it is one of the most wonderfully performing global bank in the world. And it's an Indian who's leading the show there in Qatar. Then we also have Mr. Sumant Katpalia. Uh, we have a few people like Mr. Dinesh Khara, from the, uh, the current chairman of the SBI. These are the people who are being recognized. And here we have uh, Mr. Ramakrishnan, the MD and CEO SIB, who told me two years back when he was stepping into the shoes of the CEO and MD of this organization, that his focus will be conservative and on the small ticket loans. And that is what he's delivered. We'll hear from him. But before that, let me bring in Madam Kakkar. She was the one person who set up the disabilities department, also was chairman of the NCPCR. She's worked with children extensively. She's worked in various capacities with the industry as joint secretary industries as well. Information broadcasting also, she was the JS. So, Madam Kaka, disabilities, banking sector, do they really have done some work or do they need to back up their, you know, job towards the sector of the disabilities, especially? Amit, thank you for uh, inviting me. In fact, uh, I'm talking to the doyens of the sector. And uh, I must just quickly uh, comment on what Mr. Vasudev said, ki why there's a huge mortality rate of the, in the MSME sector. You see, uh, Mr. Uh, Kumar and I, when we were working in NSIC, we had noticed this problem and we started the scheme for mentoring of uh, the startups. You know, it is very important even for the startups and the people who are running uh, organizations because see the environment is changing all the time. The uh, technology is changing all the time. Rules are changing almost every minute, whether it's COVID rules, banking rules, you take it, they're, they're changing every minute. So you need somebody to mentor them and handhold people. And then probably we'll be able to reduce the number of people who are sort of packing up and leaving. Anyway, I'm, I'll come back to disabilities. Now we are, you know, I've always been talking about the financial inclusion of disabled people. Why disabled people are looked down upon is that because they are treated as unproductive assets within families and by society. So if we give them economic empowerment, they become mainstreamed. You know, it is the uh, sort of the money in your pocket that, uh, that sort of uh, you, you are assessed with. Now, financial inclusion doesn't only mean banking. It means banking, it means insurance, and it also means credit. I mean, it is savings, credit, and insurance. And these three terms have been defined by UN Secretary General Kofi Annan, who said that we need, we money, disabled people need all these three things. Now, it has been assessed. And all disabled people more or less are left out of the financial inclusion process. Some work has been done by banks for including blind people, but they form a, a part of the disabled group. But uh, we need to do much more because if you leave out disabled people, it has been assessed you're affecting your adversely affecting your economy, almost up to between six to 7% of your GDP. It's a huge amount. Now the most, I'll come just to the problems of disability. You know, we all know if you don't financially include people, your quality of HDI is, you know, there's a correlation, poverty and HDI. So we have to, have to include disabled people. The problem comes 
also within the disability group when it comes to the intellectually disabled people. They are the most marginalized intellectually. Maneki, their mental capacity is a little reduced. They may not have the capacity to speak or communicate like the autistic people. And the biggest problem facing parents today who have a child who's intellectually disabled is what happens to the child after they go, after, you know, the child will live on because with good medical facilities, children will survive the parents. So this is one area where all of us need to think deeply. It may not be your own child, but it may be a child that you're close to. And we all have to think in terms of these th three things, credit, banking, and insurance. So uh, let us, you know, I would say, Amit, let us sit together because with the intellectual disabled, a uh, legal issue comes up about their legal capacities. The law says something, UNCRPD says something, but the person who's at the desk it thinks in a very different way. So these are issues which need to be sorted out. I will not get into more issues like this, but work for financial inclusion of disabled people, I would say has not even started yet. We need to do it. The country needs to save this six to 7% or 8% of the GDP and include them in our mainstream economic activities. Thank you so much. Ma'am, ma you've also been the chairperson uh, post your uh, superannuation as the chairperson of the NCPCR, the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights. And child abuse issues, human trafficking issues, these are issues which have plagued the country and they are also infecting the ecosystem and the economy. Now, uh, can the banking and the NBFC sector, uh, or are they doing something for this under uh, your chairmanship? Have you seen, under your chairpersonship, have you seen good initiatives by the bank, support from the bank and NBFCs? Uh, then we can bring in the stakeholders from the sector to talk about what they've really done. Actually, you know, now that you're, we are talking to the banks, child abuse and all, ye to hota hai. well off houses may be, hota hai, so I can't say there's an economic factor to it. But RBI made a very good, uh, di issued a very good directive for child, fin uh, child uh, finance, you know. And uh, a lot of work has been done in foreign countries. Uh, what RBI said, ki let a minor of 10 years open a bank account. And uh, this will give a lot of, I would say again, economic empowerment to the vulnerable and marginalized children, especially children on the street, because they are earning. They have come away from their homes. They've run away from homes. They don't want to go back. In some cases, they're also the breadwinners. Now, if we, as a campaign, start bank accounts for all these children, give them you know, some amount of money or have work out with the insurance, a small, you know, one of those friendly insurance schemes, you know, like we had Nirmaya in uh, the ministry for disabled people that their medical expenses will be covered. These children will be empowered. These children sort of are working as an economic necessity and they will get out of the clutches of crime because there is a cycle to it. Dysfunctional homes, they come onto the streets once they come onto the streets, even if they work at times, they may not make enough money to eat food. They get into petty uh, thievery. Then they become marked for life and they get into this ratchet of crime. They cannot come out with it. They are marked by the police. They are marked by the gangs who will pick up these juvenile offenders. And that's the end of it. You know, from one crime to another crime, it will keep on escalating or they get into drug abuse or a lot of their money is also spent on medical health, you know, issues. So if we could start a sort of encourage this banking habit, a savings ha habit with these children, then a lot of lives will be turned around. Thank you so much. Ma'am, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure bankers will be able to throw more light on what can be done because supporting these people is fine, but from a, a profitability perspective, from a business perspective, how the banks look at it, 
we'll have to hear from them amit, now amit one thing sorry i'm interrupting is the rbi circular that i'm quoting that a child as young as 10 years can open a minor account without any guardianship so they we have recognized the legal capacity of these children to run operate their own accounts and since they are taking you know living independently i'm sure they can manage their own finance provided we let them inside the portals of our uh, fancy buildings institutions and there is this lady called jerome belli moria who started childline who has done work throughout she's an international jeffrey i mean in my show i'll be talking to you at 4 o'clock she she is an international figure today who has worked on child finance so it's something that we just need to implement thank you so much thank you uh, suti ma'am uh, let me bring in uh, you know dr dk agarwal uh, or my dear friends the uh, former president of the phd chamber of commerce and industry and also the chairman of the smc capital markets limited he works a lot with the banking sector through his bonds and you know debentures and all those kind of investment issues uh, agarwal ji banking and nbfc your takes as the former president of this wonderful chamber 100 year old plus chamber dr dk agarwal if you are there online uh, can you please uh, start speaking sir dr dk agarwal dr agarwal okay uh, kumar sahab uh, so dr agarwal is there Yes, yes, sir. Doctor Agarwal, your views as the former chairman of the PSC Chamber of Commerce and also the chairman of the SMC Capital Markets. You've been working with the banks through your investment issues, portfolio issues, and we have the bankers with us. Your views on the sector before we bring in the keynote speaker. Thank you, Amiji. First of all, I would like to thank you for uh, having me here and uh, having the opportunity of uh, interacting and listening to uh, the dignitaries. the chief justice former chief justice of india mdn ceo of uh, south indian bank uh, mr narendra uh, who was the former uh, cmd of uh, iot i think it was really uh, i must say that uh, i'm really very happy uh, for your uh, inviting me to this uh, program uh, first of all i would like to because uh, mr uh, hp kumar he mentioned about uh, smes so i would say that uh, this msme sector you know this is the engine of growth and if you, india has to achieve inclusive growth then we have to promote msme sector and uh, if uh, you know india has to grow prosperous then we have to make sure that our msmes they become prosperous and uh, there are many things uh, which needs to be done for msme the first and foremost you know uh, as he rightly raised that uh, the biggest problem of msme sector is the availability of credit first the credit is not available there are many msmes who are having very good business model who are having very good products the services whatever they are doing but because of the paucity of funds they are not able to expand and sometimes it results into you know the closure of business second even if the fund is available it is available at a very high cost and uh, there are uh, you know requirements of collateral security uh there are so many issues which msme face in getting credit so i think uh, uh a very serious effort has to be done from uh, government side from uh, even uh, the banks who are you know who, who may not be directly funding to these msmes in a very big way but uh, they are giving funding to nbfcs who ultimately act as a distributor of the funding to msmes so if uh, the credit to these msmes you know to do this nbfcs if uh, you know particularly those msmes those nbfcs who are giving funds to these msmes if some kind of relaxation can be given and uh, more funding access is given to these nbfcs i think this overall ecosystem will definitely uh, make a big contribution to the development of msmes and of course the taxation rate when corporates because most of the msme sector they are in the form of corporate uh, in the form of proprietorship or llp or partnership uh, uh, when we say 99% of enterprises are msme i will say majority of them are either llp or partnership form or uh, sole proprietorship so the taxation rate uh, which is applicable to a corporate 
you know the idea is that msme should get some benefit here instead of getting benefit they are being taxed at a normal rate of uh, 30% and uh, where their income is more maybe even uh, for it goes the rate goes up to 40% so that is again a very very big issue and we have to see that if not um, some concession is given to them at least they should be brought at par and another thing which i uh, strongly feel that in india uh, the way china has done it the cluster uh, kind of development so where let us say uh, in a district uh, every every district has some specialization and if we can have a cluster kind of development in these districts on a uh, say on a particular product which uh, that district specializes so that would uh, make lot of infrastructure lot of common facilities available to them at a very cheaper price and their cost of doing business their cost of logistics everything will come down so i think that is the need of the day and of course uh, uh, talking about this uh, nbfc and banking sector my sense is that uh, though government did a lot and uh, rbi also was very uh, considerate while uh, during those covid times and lot of funding uh, you know a lot of line was uh, Uh, given to nbfcs and um, uh, funding became accessible to uh, these nbfcs but i will say that uh, the problem has not stopped here whatever benefits were given in last two years they should be another, extended by another one year or maybe even two years because even the problem is not over we need to make sure that because of the funds or because of the funding no enterprise should close down because here these enterprises are closing down not because of any uh you know bad intention or any malafide intention but because of the uh, crisis which has uh, come into the system so we have to extend all those benefits uh, even uh, the performance guarantee which uh, the msme sector has to give to you know these um, uh, for any uh, tender and all that so even those uh, benefits should also be extended so if all, all these uh, benefits and uh, all those concessions which had been given during covid times if they are extended uh, further by uh, at least one year i think that would be a big service to this msm industry thank you thank you thank you mr agarwal uh, you know you have uh, been working with the nbfc sector because you already already are the chairman of the smc capital markets one of the leading players in the nbfc segment and i'm sure going forward there will be a lot of engagement you will be having with these bankers including the south indian bank which is Uh, touted as the renal the renal means the it's a, you know artery of the country now because regional bank with a national presence muli ramakrishna leading the show over to you a uh, south indian banks initiatives and try to address the issues which have been put forth by the honorable luminaries today on the show mr muli ramakrishna thank you thank you amit uh, first of all uh, <coughs> i thank amit uh, for giving me a great platform to share some of my thoughts on very important issues which got discussed prior to my talk uh, esteemed dignitaries it's my pleasure to get to see you in a person and uh, it's my privilege and honor to be sharing some of the thoughts which i have in this area uh, let me uh, uh, spell out the uh, issue which is being the focus of attention for us which is sme and therefore how do we make sme credit uh, which is the most of, uh, talked about issue uh, when we heard so many speakers and it is very very relevant for the situation which the country is in today slightly going back to what we have done in the last couple of years even prior to covid hitting the country if you were to look at the gdp growth of this country it's been um, 8% in fi 16 8.3 in fi 17 8 6.6 in fi 18 6.1 in fi 19 4.2 in fi 20 and of course fi 21 we had a negative growth now even if you look at the period prior to covid the country was actually showing a little bit of a decelerated growth so therefore whenever we talk about v shaped growth going back to pre covid times even that is not sufficient for the simple reason that with that kind of growth we cannot actually provide employment for the entire youth which is coming into the country which is the demographic advantage which we often talk about in our country therefore we need to really look at a growth which should be far more than 8 to 10% uh, uh, kind of gdp growth that is possible only when only and only when smes get the uh, required attention and um, i think some of the points which were made prior to my talk has actually resonates lot with what this industry or segment is going through sme is such a 
complex segment that it has got the features like retail on one side. I'm, I'm now wearing the hat of a banker and I'm looking at SME's uh, characteristics so that you get to understand how a typical banker will views this uh, segment. And therefore, what all has been done till now in the ecosystem and what can be done more and how do we actually uh, make this uh, dream possible of India going to much higher double-digit growth with the fillip which has to be given for the SME sec sector as a whole. The way I look at SME, the way we look at SME as a lender is, SME has got a characteristic which is similar to retail in some aspects, and it has got a characteristic which is very similar to corporate in certain aspects. So this is a very different sort of, uh, for want of a better word, animal, which has got characteristics like retail because the deals, deals are very small, it can be easily scaled up. The appraisal of a lower end SME can be very much mimicked like a way we do appraisal of a retail case. It is well diversified. Therefore, diversification of risk is happening. Their requirements could be for a very simple requirement for, uh, uh, for something like a monthly expenses to uh, something very large like setting up a warehouse or setting up a refrigeration uh, a unit or whatever. So the ticket sizes can be small as well as it can, be, uh, can go up to even large ticket sizes. This is on one side, you talk about diversification of risk happening through focusing on lower end of SME. If you look at the other end of SME, that is where they mimic some of the corporate because the entire appraisal from a banker's perspective happens like the way we do appraisal of a corporate case, wherein we look at financials, where we look at many other things, business model, how the suppliers, vendors, dealers, what kind of ecosystem, whether it has got a seasonality, whether the industry has a cyclicality, uh, whether the uh, business model can withstand the ups and downs which the industry has been witness to. All these, uh, uh, to a large extent, not only requires uh, secondary level information, but also requires a good understanding of the financial strength of the unit. This is where the trickiness of SME comes in. Why, if we, if we often ask the question, why SMEs are not getting the due attention, it is due to the various multivaried experiences of various lenders. If you look at our own Indian banking system over the last few years, you would have seen that some of the very well-known, well-run banks, they've had a phase when SME was doing very well for them. They went through a phase when SME wasn't doing well for them. Again, you find SMEs of a particular segment getting impacted more, SMEs of a particular uh, target segment doing exceedingly well. So you have all kinds of mixed experiences and uh, they are as varied as an individual, as a retail customer would be. Therefore, you also have the situation of what one speaker talked about, where they get funding and then they finally one day vanish. And, they, and you can't find the traces of them. So it is due to this misfortune, mis, misadventure of these few, few people who are forming part of this industry. The whole industry is getting a very, very uh, sort of colored look from the uh, lens of a lender. So uh, when a lender looks at a SME, Obviously, uh, as much as any of you spoke about the need of funding them, the need of helping them when they need money, the need that they are not intentionally bad, but then they need a financial help, etc. Today, honestly, I can tell you, money is available in surplus. All the banks have enough and more liquidity today. B, if, if there are enough good number of customers available for availing funding, I think banks will be more than happy to lend more than what is required. The reason why today, I, I don't know how many of you have been tracking the interest rates which are going around in the country today for a SME. In my 30, 30 plus years of banking experience, I have never seen an SME getting a loan at 7.5% and 7.25%, which is what is happening today. Why is it happening? I think it's a good fodder for thought. How SME today can get rates of 7, 7 and 7.75% 7 is because lot of money is chasing few good customers. If a lot of money is chasing few good, good customers, the few good customers can obviously demand very good rates because every bank today wants to add an incrementally good portfolio to their balance sheet. Therefore, especially if somebody talked about NPA issue, Mr. Narendra, a veteran banker, talked about NPA issue plaguing SME and the banking industry as a whole. It's, uh, one need not uh, go far away. Just look back and see what is happening in the last two to three years. In a state like Kerala, when it has been successfully hit with floods for two consecutive years and then followed by a COVID. This kind of continuous disasters happening in a state for three years or four years in succession can, can destabilize anybody. Forget about SME. And destabilize even a mid-sized corporate. 
So SMEs definitely have gone through a very tough phase. And look at individual retailers, retail customers today. All of them have had bad salary cuts, loss of jobs, many other things because of the economy shrinking and the headwinds which are there in the economy. So when you look at the incremental slippages which is happening across the banking system today, you find that retail and SME definitely are contributing a lot of slippages. Fortunately, the corporate, which used to be the biggest drain in the growth over the last few years, they have all been handled well. And they are all now, if you look at the good corporate today, they are all going and closing the limits which are available with the bank, leading to degrowth happening in the corporate book of some of the banks. And uh, of course, with the new impetus given to infrastructure, which is what got discussed in the two-day FICI conference, where a lot of emphasis was talked about infrastructure financing, etc. Hopefully, if that comes back and uh, talking about one lakh crore of capital being put in for the new in unit, which is going to be headed by Mr. Kamath, and with the way they are talking about taking the book sizes to three lakh, four lakh crores, I'm hoping that a lot of infrastructure development is going to happen in the country, which is badly needed for the country of our size, which would definitely propel the SME activity in the days and years to come. Therefore, if we get the act right, I believe that a good entrepreneur with a sensible business model who has thought through will be more than happy to get funded by many banks. Therefore, it is not the dearth of money. It is the dearth of good customer, dearth of good ideas, which is what is going to actually make this industry really go up again. Okay, having said that, it's very important to know why there, there has been very mixed experiences of SME? This is where I think the complexity of this business comes in. If you look at the SME, you are talking about somebody with a, let's say, 1 crore turnover to as high as 250 crore turnover. If you look at the needs, if you look at the uh, scope, if you look at the uh, uh, ecosystem in which they operate, it's completely different. For somebody with a 1 crore, 2 crore kind of top line to somebody who is running with a 200 crore outfit, it's a very different ecosystem which they need to handle. Therefore, if you are putting them as SME, which is MSME, micro, small, medium, etc., the needs are very different. Therefore, the need to do appraisal is very different. Therefore, the bankers will have to look at this segment with a very different mindset because when they look at the various uh, sectors within this big uh, frame of 0 to 250 crores of turnover companies. This is where I think the cluster model, somebody talked about clusters being geographical clusters, I would also say, apart from geographical clusters, it's also important to know the industry clusters. Because when a homogeneous set of customers are coming together, when you're looking at an apparel sector as a whole, or when you're looking at a construction segment as a whole, or when you're looking at a pharmaceutical SMEs as a whole, there are certain similarities, there are certain things which you can draw as a commonality amongst those. And if you come out with the norms which are going to be mimicking the characteristics of those, then you will be able to put your money in the place where it actually matters. Then you will be able to assess the riskiness properly. Then you will be able to guide him properly. Let us face it, SME entrepreneurs need as much financial knowledge from the bankers who can be a very good financial advisors to them. I always believe that bankers are partners in progress for SME. You look at very big corporates today, JSWs or, uh, or uh, uh, Adani groups, they were all SMEs at one point in time. They have all grown to the sizes which they have grown today because of various support which they got over a period of their long growth and eminent bankers being supporting them by their uh, valuable advice and really directing them into areas where they can actually look at for growth, etc. That is why you develop a big, big corporates. So I have this one saying whenever I meet with SME customer, that a banker will always be available even if you grow your business to 100 times, 1000 times your present size, provided your credit discipline is good. This is where I think credit discipline becomes very important and government and bureaus have done a fantastic job over the last 10 to 15 years to really make an ecosystem available today for any lender to know about the history of a, a customer as to what he has done in the past and whether he has defrauded the bank or whether he has went in for a settlement because Unfortunately, as I said, it's a few uh, black sheep which have actually created a big scar on the entire segment as a whole. So if you can clearly decipher them, clearly understand what went wrong, why did they do what they did, etc. I'm sure as a banker, we'll be able to take care of those uh, risks very, very well. And we can, and this is one segment which you can comfortably price to the risk. As we said, SMEs always have the advantage of 
competitively running their business because they are not uh, uh, people who are going to be running an all india business they might have a very big competitive advantage because they operate in a geography they operate in a market segment where they can enjoy a tremendous cost advantage where they can enjoy a tremendous competitive advantage it's the ability of the banker also to find out the distinct uniqueness of the sme which is coming up and to support him with the right kind of capital right kind of working capital required so that he is able to put his foot in the right areas and he's able to stabilize his business and he's able to you know uh, cater to the needs of the society with its products or services and today with the way digital digitization is happening i think bankers are also have got enough and more resources available in the ecosystem to do many things where for which we don't need to go to the customer to gather data from them somebody talked about sme is not getting money because of collateral not being available i think these were were issues are the issues today also yes there could be some banks still might be following but there are enough and more banks available today who are willing to take an unsecured who are willing to give an unsecured business loan to a good sme customer provided he has got a track record he or she has got a track record of servicing it with a good intent and ability so there are enough and more products available so coming back to digitization the one of the things which used to plague sme is the timeliness of uh, the facility which they are seeking for and the turnaround time is far more than what they would desire obviously they will miss the opportunity to probably source a product at a competitive price or maybe to avail a particular uh, uh, scheme which might be offered by a corporate from where they are buying uh, products or services all this is possible only when you make the adva uh, facilities available in the within the specified time this is where i think turnaround time for meeting up with the requirement of sme customer from their sourcing to onboarding is very very important digitization has done a fantastic job in this because today on a single platform the entire file flow can happen and through apis you can actually get plug to many of the externally available databases today from where we can get data we don't have to be dependent on customer we can actually pull data do our uh, uh, comparison appraisal and make the credit available within a short possible time i am not saying it will happen immediately because anything which can be done so immediately probably can also go wrong but within a very reasonable <laughs> time frame i think the fun, uh, the facilities can be made available to sme so in my mind uh, just to touch upon few things today the canvas of smes are definitely changing with the huge drive happening in the tech stack developed by the country and with the data availability which is now available more than ever in the last if you compare it with the last 3 to 4 decades with the way banking system today is equipped to uh, do lot of data analytics do lot of uh, getting lot of business insights about what can what how we can structure a transaction how we can help the entrepreneur to set his business properly how we can be a valuable advisor to them with those things coming in i think the complete paradigm in which this sme is operating on different today definitely money is available in plenty and i think as a country we have or we are enjoying a significant positioning in the global market today whole world is looking at the growth of the country probably will be one of the top 3 countries which are with a very very high growth uh, probably comparable to uh, countries like us or whatever therefore i am saying banking system in india with the uh, with the way we have organized ourselves with the kind of uh, supervisory uh, regime in which we are all operating i think but for these few accidents which happened with a couple of banks the banking system is robust it is very strong the regulators are extremely strong they are definitely ensuring that banking system don't go astray and they don't do anything which is not nonsensical which is not to be done with a strong stable banking system with a strong stable ecosystem with a strong stable understanding of this segment with lot more insights being available now to understand these customers and with a very sensible responsible banking this is where i think it's very important to know that we need to be responsible banking we cannot keep on giving more and more despite knowing that the customer is indisciplined this is where some some of the banks have gone wrong in the past by making more and more credit available where he doesn't need which made him actually get ideas to divert this money to uh, take away the money for creating his own assets etc etc this is one reason why bankers are still wanting to have more security because they know that money has been siphoned away and lot of assets have been created in his personal name today when you go and take uh, action against such customers there was a question asked to mr balakrishnan about a legal one thing which i have seen having worked in india and having worked outside of india one thing which is a big difference 
between us and some of the well-run countries is the efficiency with which a legal case will get settled. I remember in a place like Hong Kong, when we go against a, a, a erring customer, a defaulting customer, we can make him come to terms for discussion within flat one week. And we can actually make, uh, seize his office, take his, take his assets, all can be done within 7 to 15 days. It's possible there. With such efficient system, you can very well imagine any SME or a banker who is operating in ecosystem will do responsible things. If things can take five years, 10 years for settling a case, today the entrepreneur thinks that he can do anything and nothing will happen to him for the next five to 10 years. And today, money being drained through such NPAs, we can create so much of employment. We can create so much of funding available to the inclusive banking, which Ma'am Stuti has talked about. I fully reciprocate, respond, uh, align with her thoughts. So much of money can be made available to so many wonderful institutions which are doing a fantastic job in doing inclusion. In fact, from our bank, through our CSR, we work with a lot of uh, institutions which are serving this uh, uh, differently abled people, mentally handicapped kids. We do a lot of such uh, work through CSR activity. And if only these money, which is just going down the drain, where people are uh, disputing and it takes years and years to settle, if that money is made available, even one hundredth of that can make all the children who are differently able to be included in the system, in the mainstream. That much of money is just going down the drain because of crook, crooks, crooked activities of some entrepreneurs who are just taking the system for a ride. So I am of the view that we should strengthen the legal system. We should strengthen the ecosystem, which I think the country had done a fat, fabulous job. We should do responsible banking. And Babo all, I think as a citizen of the country, wanting this country to get into double-digit growth, all of us have a responsibility because fortunately we are all sitting in positions of power where we can do a lot more, where we must do a lot more and make this country get into double-digit growth not just for a few years to come, like the way China experienced, we should have next two decades of double-digit growth that can bring completely India out of a developing country into a well-developed country with a strong value system in the country. This is where I think we as a player in the ecosystem can do a lot more. Thank Mr. you Ramakrishna. once again. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramakrishna. Muli, Muli one uh, question that comes out from uh, what you have been speaking. Do you also recommend localized uh, banking approach because you cannot have the same credit appraisal systems across the length and breadth of the country for people with national footprints. Bankers like you, who are slowly, you know, emanating from the southern part of the country to the rest of the country, you know, I'm sure you're putting in place because one rotten apple can spoil the entire basket. So can you have such kind of localized banking approach, banking systems, so that, you know, the, the, the streamlining of uh, the credits, the defaults, they are minimized because I haven't seen such thing happening. What is your take on that? Even Mr. Narendra Kaur and Mr. S.P. Kumar could throw some light on that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you are right. Yeah, in fact, not only in SME, I would say that uh, the credit culture across the country is very, very different and therefore credit needs are also very, very different. Therefore, not only in SME, in every other uh, area also, we need to have some local uh, differences which has to come in, especially true for SMEs. This is where I think there are few things which are very, very basic to a financial uh, under financial understanding or financial discipline of any entity. Forget about SME, any entity. Therefore, there are always these do's and don'ts. There are go and no go, which are extremely critical. These are fundamental principles. If an organization is too much leverage, if the organization is got too much of debtors, if the working capital cycle is far more than, these are all very fundamental to an efficient running of the organization. Whether they are present in Kerala or present in Punjab, this is going to hit them black and blue, and they are not going to survive. So there are something which are very, very fundamental. There are something which are very specific to the segment which I talked about. Even the industry segment, for example, pharma requirements will be very different from a auto dealer requirement, which will be very different from a, uh, let's say, a logistic company. Therefore, we need to have specific norms which are going to be more aligned to for the specific cluster we are talking about. Once you take care of the fundamental things which are very, very common for all and the specific things which are very, very akin to a specific industry segment, thereafter, whatever you need to do for the various parts of the country is a little bit of change in the credit culture. That's all I would say. Because today, fortunately, we are nationally hooked. Therefore, we can get data, full data from any part of the country and we can make a good assessment about the viability of any individual. Therefore, I, I would say it is not impossible Yes, it takes a little effort, but I think it's doable. Nothing to really 
sweat about it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramakrishna. Narendra ji, your closing remarks. And then Mr. Kumar can end the show. Mr. H.P. Kumar, your camera, can you kindly switch it on? And then we will close the show with uh, you. Uh, Mr. Narendra, your closing yeah, remarks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are we having uh, Ramakrishna has covered quite a lot. And uh, as uh, one thing is the performance of the Indian uh, uh, banks, particularly the public sector bank in the recent days has improved a lot. And they have made a provision coverage even uh, up to 70-80% for all the old accounts. And uh, their, uh, even the last three, four quarters, they are all banks which were showing losses. They have started showing profit. And there is the only of the PCO. And they are also now fairly capitalized, more than 16% capital uh, uh, average of the capital uh, risk ratio. And recently they have assessed quite a lot of capital from the market, either by equity or by the bond or the tier two or what you call your uh, uh, perpetual bonds. So now the bank's dependence on capital support from the government also likely to be lower or may not be required also. One more thing is in our drive towards 5 trillion economy, the credit to GDP ratio of the Indian banking system has to go up. It is currently maybe around 60-65%. Globally, it is even above 100%. So in the infrastructure sector or in the any new projects coming after this COVID, now that things are improving, New capital uh, projects are also started coming. And other day, SBA chairman has said the green shoots are coming. So their ability to lend for India story, India's growth story, is now more pronounced. And uh, the which banks are India banks are public some of the after amalgamation merger also. Now these banks are also now recently the information that all have become profitable and they are showing profit. So the strength of the Indian bank and particularly that our FM mission that we should have at least uh, two, three banks equivalent to state bank and in the global 50 number, they should figure. For that, these uh, efforts of even the, like, you know, the amalgamation merger and also there may be privatization bank uh, of the public sector bank will lead to a growth story and all the banks will gear up and they will see the uh, productive credit demand of the Indian economy is met and uh, as you rightly said, with the national establishment of bad bank, as well as EMC also, I think all the old accounts, including around 90,000 are being transferred and they will find a recovery. And the IBC has come as a game changer. With the IBC now, today, it is in creditors in control, not the debtors in control. And uh, the average recovery, the first instance of the, uh, what you call, accepted claims, which is supported by whatever you are, what you call the, securities, it was hovering around 40-45% and 35% recovery. There are cases which are hardly around 5%. So that's where uh, now the IBBI is uh, tightening the guidelines relating to even uh, creditors, uh, uh, secure creditors, uh, how they should take decision. Similarly, in terms of uh, cross-border uh, uh, insolvency and uh, in every uh, area, the liquidation has to be avoided by immediately taking the cases at a faster pace because some of the liquidations are very old case. And uh, the recently, the RBI also, also come with the, uh, their guidelines and report on the ARC. And uh, the, it is mentioned that the bank should uh, sell such uh, non-performing asset, ideally at the earliest to the ARC, so that uh, the resolution can come faster. All of the idea is to see that resolution and not merely recovery. Recovery is any of there are legal like DRT and other... Uh, legal surface and other action. But the idea is the productive asset of the Indian economy should be got revived and it can find change of management, which is happening now. And uh, this is will act as the end with the pre-pack arrangement for MSME also have been brought so that uh, such as the SMEs which are stressed can find solution through the uh, pre-pack arrangement through the NCLT route at a faster phase, hardly 90 days. So, in all respect, the ecosystem has been developed and I am sure this will go a long way in seeing that the Indian banks will play an active role in reaching the 5 trillion economy immediately and later 10 trillion economy as envisaged by our Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you. Narendra ji, former CMD, Indian Overseas Bank and one of the 
key participants of the forum's initiative uh, over the last one year. Thank you so much, sir. Dr. H.P. Kumar, uh, former CMD co NS NSIC, one key institution to drive this small industry's growth. We have a firm belief that Sachin Tendulkar, the way he used to open the innings and whenever he used to close the innings, that would mean India has won the match. In 83 gets released today. It's an important, uh, you know, event that happened on the 25th of July to 1983. And, uh, you know, the dates don't match. But yes, mindsets do match. We also believe in opening and then closing the innings through one batsman himself. And Tendulkar of the show, Mr. S.P. Kumar, closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, see, one thing is very clear and government knows that very that there is a gap of twenty five lakh crore in availability of credit. When you say 20, hello, hello. I think I think your network is a problem. Up, up. Please, please uh, restart again, and now we can see and hear you. Yeah. Hey, audible now. Am I audible now? Hello? Yes, 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 audible. yes. yes. Oh, you're audible now. Okay, yes. okay, okay. So what I was saying is that there is a gap of 25 lakh crore on the one side in regard with regard to availability of credit. For oh, credit. On the other hand, we heard the bankers also, senior bankers, that banks are flush with money and uh, a lot of money is chasing very few customers, very few MSMEs. So on the one side, there is a demand. On the other side, there is a money available from the banking system. The gap, 25 lakh crore, which is existing, can be abridged by way of certain policy initiatives from the government. And that is why we say that the government should come forward and the Reserve Bank of India should come forward. Because both sides are ready. Banks are ready to finance. MSMEs are ready to take. So why is this gap continuing for such a long time? A lot of initiatives have been taken by the government of India. But then this gap has been widening. They are is that some of the uh, Narendra had talked about the uh, you know IBC and NCLT provisions and the pre-packaged solutions for for settlement of the cases. I would say that one provision which requires immediate change to bring confidence among the people, among the bankers particularly, is the NPA provision. As of today. If you don't pay the installment and interest for 90 days and default for 90 days, your, your account becomes NPA. And once you become NPA, you are virtually touch me not for any, any of the banks or financial institutions. So that 90 days limit, why it is sacrosanct? I know that we are following the international norms of banking, parcel norms, but then we have to look at the conditions and ecosystem of our own country also, where we find that there are huge delayed payments the bills are not realized. Even the government department and PSUs and government organizations don't pay for six months to nine months. The working cycle of, of the MSMEs exceeds much beyond 90 days. Today, you purchase the raw material, <laughs> convert it into finished goods, then package it and sell it, and then uh, make efforts to realize the payment. It's much more than 90 days. I mean, uh, 90 days to realize karne mein lag jate. So when we know that the working cycle of MSMEs is six months, why don't we increase our NPA requirement provisions from 90 days to 180 days? We have been requesting the government for this. A lot of companies will get saved. We should not be closing down the MSMEs. Actually, what is happening is this, one nine, this, eight, nine, this 90 days provision of NPA has virtually led to closure of certain companies, a large number of companies. We are not able to established new enterprises that's the, in the speed, the way we are closing the company. 
by virtue of our policy of 90 days. I, I don't know what, what this 90 days is all about. When we know that practically the working cycle is 180 days, more than 90 days, and uh, our conditions are different when people don't bother. I think somebody mentioned about the, uh, the difficulty in uh, realization of bills and the legal uh, uh, you know, <coughs> way of settling the whole thing. So that is another problem. We know that in, in World Bank, ease of doing business index that we have, uh, legal dispute redressal mechanism, we are at 163 out of 190 countries. So if we are not able to legally settle the whole thing, we are just fast enough to close the companies by taking them to IBC and uh, you know NCLT provisions and then doing all that. So one provision which needs to be changed is NPA provision. And other, of course, as uh, Mr. Narendra mentioned, is the pre-package solution for the MSMEs to resettle the cases. I would say that before taking any case to IBC and NCLT, at least give him one chance for restructuring. RBI announced restructuring provisions last time due to the COVID impact, but then gave a very small window for restructuring to the banks. So that provision also needs to be amended. You give at least one chance to the defaulting MSMEs to restructure whatever way you can do that. And depending upon the capacity of the MSME concerned MSME, once the account is restructured, if they don't comply with the restructured requirement, take them to NCLT and IBC. That is not a problem. So these changes in provisions will surely bring in some kind of confidence among the bankers and will help in bridging this gap in availability of credit. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you all. Uh, uh, wonderful discussion we have had today. Thanks to Mr. Muli Ramakrishnan and South Indian Bank and we wish them a very good future in the next one year, which is starting in the next uh, seven, 10 days. And Madam Kaka, she has been gracious enough as always. Uh, she's one of the patrons and Mr. Vasudeva, who has enriched us with his experiences in disaster management, experience in environment, forest. He was the principal chief conservator of forest in Marshall Pradesh. Then Narendra ji, the former CMD IOB, they are notwithstanding uh, the great support I've been receiving from Justice K.G. Balakrishnan Ji, former Chief Justice of India, we look forward to carrying forward this banking series in the days to come. Wish you all a very, very happy new year in advance and Merry Christmas for tomorrow. Look, look forward. Jai Hind and Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.